Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege on behalf of my fellow colleagues of the Board of Trustees of UNC Asheville to welcome you to our sixth annual Honorans Dinner. In a special way, I welcome each of our honorans. This is a very special university, a very special evening for all of us. This is our chance to celebrate the achievements of our honorans, and as we do, we also celebrate our commitment to the excellence of the Liberal Arts University that we are able to do so in the company of so many people from our community makes this an extra special evening. This is one of my favorite evenings because it always sparkles. And as it gets darker, we notice all the candles and the little white lights and the setting's always so pretty. As our university continues to achieve extraordinary national preeminence, we thank you for your commitment to our mission of providing the liberal arts experience at its best. We have much to be proud of at UNC Asheville and appreciate dip deeply your commitment to the university. Now, my notes say to introduce, introduce the chancellor, but I never do that right now. And um, I don't know if everybody present, I imagine most of you, but not everybody knows that this is Jim Mullins uh, last um, honorans dinner and his last year on our campus as our chancellor. And uh, this dinner was a tradition that Jim brought to us six years ago and it's become very, very special, at least in my heart and I hope you all enjoy it. Um, so I need to talk to you a little bit about some of the wonderful things Jim has done for us. And last year I stood up here like an idiot and talked about what, how we were going to keep him a secret so nobody would snatch him. <laughs> and I never should have said a thing. You know, I should have, should have read what they told me to read and go and went on. <laughs> but anyways, um, I think that Jim's most valued legacy is his strong personal relationships with our students. He has vested his confidence, his trust, and his hope in their future. Since he's arrived here, he's attended student government meetings. He's invited students to dinner at his home. Uh, when we had hurricanes, he invited them to spend the night. I don't know if Mary knew it or not, but <laughs> they came. <laughs> Since his first week on campus, he's been joining the students in the um, dining hall, and he's engaged them in chats in the quad. At other times, you could see him playing frisbee or tag football. I don't know if you're still playing tag football, Jim, but he did at one time. And recently, he was seen in a very nice business suit climbing into a dusty, dirty kiln because a student wanted to explain how pottery is made. Many of our students who we talk to say that Chancellor Mullen makes them feel like they're the most important person on the world, on campus, and as far as Jim's concerned, our students are right when they feel that way. In his installation address six years ago, the chancellor said, the University of North Carolina at Asheville will not sit as an island. We will not be aloof and apart from this community and its needs. To the people of Asheville, to the pink people of Buncombe County and our surrounding counties, to the people of North Carolina, I promise you that service is and will remain integral to our identity as a place of learning. This is your university and your campus. We intend to live the lessons we teach, and in doing so, to work in partnership wherever and however this community believes that we can make a difference. Jim Mullen is a man true to his word. There have been too many initiatives over the past six years for me to list. But in the last few months, we've begun planning for the new North Carolina Center for Health and Wellness, which will house an academic and outreach program focusing on regional issues of childhood obesity, workplace wellness, and senior wellness. 
earlier this week, just earlier this week, and this is a man who's going to be leaving us in a very short period of time. UNC Asheville announced another partnership with Asheville Buncombe Technical Community College, the city of Asheville, and Buncombe County to further integrate our distinguished academic programs into the economy, cultural, and broader community. Ray Bailey, president of Asheville Technical Community College, states Jim Mullen brought the university to the community. The campus itself has seen great changes since the chancellor's arrival in 1999. During his tenure, the university has undertaken 50.2 million bond-funded capital construction programs. And you see a little bit of this as you drive around, but you're not you know, driving through muddy construction holes all the time. A highlight of this construction was when the new Highsmith University Union opened last fall, and it is well utilized by our students who are there for fun and they're there for their business. The campus environmental efforts in the area of landscaping and grounds have won numerous awards, and our first comprehensive annual report took home top prizes at the Public Relations Association of West North, Western North Carolina Best of, the Mount, Best of the Mountains Award. The chancellor presided over the largest private gift the university has ever received, a $3 million gift from the Zeiss family. The gift is a measure of their steadfast faith and their great optimism about the future of this institution. So Chancellor Mel Mullen, we send you home, home to your roots, home to your faith, and we are very, very proud of our time together. You have shown us not only to think beyond our comfort zone, but you have shown us how to make it happen by forming the critical partnerships that are necessary for progress in today's world. We thank you for your time. We thank you for your service in leading us to much recognition, to many firsts, to a long list of awards for the University of North Carolina at Asheville. And please remember, our hearts and our homes are always open to you and Mary and Frankie and James. Thank you. Now you expect me to finish the evening. I thank you, and, uh, and to each of the trustees here tonight, uh, I thank you for the leadership that you have given to your university, the vision you've set. It's been a privilege to work with each of you, with all of you here this evening. Mary and I join in welcoming each of you here to an evening that celebrates so much of what is at the core of liberal education and the University of North Carolina at Asheville. Tonight is about academic excellence. It's about service to community, to state, to nation, to world. It's about this university's commitment to the highest and the best in liberal arts education. It is about, if I might paraphrase Martha Nussbaum and Seneca, the cultivation of humanity, preparing and challenging young people to act with sensitivity and alertness and passion for justice as citizens of the whole world. And as we begin tonight, I want to recognize some folks who represent that citizenship in a very special way. From the Board of Governors of the University of North Carolina at Asheville, Ed Broadwell, his lovely wife Donna, and Adelaide Key. Thank you so very, very much. And as mentioned earlier, two individuals who have given so much to this university in the short time that we've known them, they've given so much in terms of friendship to the Mullen family. Stephen Frozine Zeiss, thank you for all you have done. And it's now my privilege to introduce you to the three extraordinary individuals who tomorrow will receive the degree Doctor of Humane Letters. As I do so, 
it is important to realize the significance of what we celebrate tonight. As we recognize the extraordinary achievements of our honorands, we honor lives devoted to excellence and to integrity. And in doing so, we celebrate the values of academic and civic distinction that they represent and for which the University of North Carolina at Asheville will always stand. It is our hope that as we celebrate our honorands, their example will inspire and challenge our graduates. And tonight we also celebrate the promise and the potential of the wonderful men and women who tomorrow will commence the next chapter in their lives. Representing them tonight are those students who have been nominated for two major student awards we will present tomorrow morning in the sunshine. The awards have special meaning for us. First, the Reynolds Award for service to our campus and second, the William and Ida Friday Award for service to the greater community. I would like to introduce these outstanding students and ask them to stand as I call their names so that we might recognize and applaud them. Remembering that it is for them and each of their fellow students that this university lives. Kimberly Gentry, Kevin Pere Gentile, Susanna Hernandez, and Deirdre Heck. Thank you. And now to our distinguished honorands. As is our tradition at the honorands dinner, I will introduce each honorand by reading the citation that he or she will receive at tomorrow's commencement ceremony. And then I will ask each to step forward for a few words of reflection and our acknowledgement. William Ivy Long. Native North Carolinian William Ivy Long is a four-time Tony Award-winning costume designer in New York with six shows currently running on Broadway and others touring and playing in cities around the world. His designs for many of Broadway's most popular musicals have won him the prestigious Tony, first in 1982 for his work on the original Broadway production of Nine, followed by Crazy For You in 1992, The Producers in 2001, and Hairspray in 2003. And just this week, William received yet another nomination for the prestigious Tony Award, this time for his design of the current Broadway production of Tennessee Williams, A Streetcar Named Desire. William Ivy Long comes from a family with a great theater tradition, and he grew up, quite literally, on stage. When his father was technical director for the Raleigh Little Theater, the family lived in a dressing room off stage left. While his mother and father taught drama at the University of North Carolina, he spent hours in the company of the famed Carolina Playmakers, whose accomplished designers, actors, and technicians instilled in him a love of dramatic arts, an appreciation of beauty, and an uncommon sense of the creative. When the family traveled to Mantio each summer to work with the celebrated outdoor drama, The Lost Colony, his father handled technical direction, his mother starred as Queen Elizabeth, and Mr. Long played one of the colony's ill-fated children. In some ways, the most successful costume designer on Broadway is a study in contrast with family roots that go back to the 17th century when his ancestor Arthur Long settled in Seaboard, North Carolina. After fighting in Bacon's Rebellion at Jamestown, Mr. Long is, as he says of himself, about as North Carolina as you can get. He moves effortlessly between the cosmopolitan world of New York and the tranquility of rural Seaboard, where 12 generations of Longs have made their home. Like his parents, he lends his considerable talents to the lost colony, designing sets and costumes for the longest running outdoor drama in the country. Meanwhile, his eye-catching avant-garde costumes grace Broadway as well as productions for opera, 
dance, television, film, the concert stage, the fashion runway, and many special events. He is friends with actors Meryl Streep and Sigourney Weaver and playwrights Christopher Durang and, Win and Wendy Wasserstein and Mary Mullen. <laughs> Six years and she's still doing that. <laughs> His classmates in the MFA program at Yale University Drama School. He is the National Theater Conference's Person of the Year for 2000, and he is the recipient of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago's Legend of Fashion Award. At home, he holds North Carolina's highest civilian honor, the Order of the Longleaf Pine. The North Carolina Award for Fine Arts, <clears throat> the Carolina Playmakers Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Roanoke Island Historical Association's Morrison Award. His alma mater, the College of William and Mary, honored him with its Leslie Cheek Award for Outstanding Presentation in the Arts and with an honorary doctoral degree at last spring's commencement. William Ivy Long masterfully bridges two wonderful worlds, the pulsing city of New York and the serenity of his North Carolina home. In both worlds, he is honored and respected for his brilliance and accomplishment, for his energy and passion, for excellence in his work, and for his innumerable contributions to community, state, and nation, and for his remarkable generosity and kindness. Broadway director Michael Wilson, another Tar Heel in New York, sums it up best. He does hairspray, and he does the lost colony. What more do you want? <laughs> and so, to William Ivy Long, who reminds us of the importance of following our dreams, using our talents to exceptional purpose, broadening our horizons while revering home and giving back to community, the University of North Carolina at Asheville will tomorrow proudly present the honorary degree Doctor of Humane Letters. William. My parents were both Carolina playmakers, and my father from Seaboard, North Carolina, uh, was Prof. Koch's uh, uh, graduate assistant in 1936 when they were wandering around the sand hills figuring out where to put the theater. And so we've, the, the Longs have been connected since 1936, and of course it opened in 1937, and my parents worked with it for over 25 years, and then my brother and I have been working with it for at least that long ever after. And I'm in my 34th season working with the Lost Colony. I'm not even 34 years old. So how did that happen? But I'm uh, thrilled. In fact, next week I go down for uh, rehearsals and then we have dress rehearsals then, and then opening and then Dare Day first, then opening. And uh, it's a very important center of how to base your life is the Lost Colony. Telling that story, that early, early settlers story and also our connection with Chapel Hill and with the Playmakers and with North Carolina and with history. I was one of those little children who was, uh, who had to play with imaginary friends and maybe this was, I think, a really good thing because part of my imaginary uh, life was also in books and uh, first they were picture books and then when I really got hooked on reading, history has always been my favorite thing and all my, my uh, extra time, in fact every night I'm reading some history book or biography before I go to sleep and some nights uh, I don't go to sleep. I, realize, oops, time to get up. I've been reading all night. So uh, very important. I think it's very important. And, and also I have a design studio in my house. And the, the quickest way to show one of the, like there's a reference um, in Streetcar Named Desire, my English director, uh, Ed Hall, who is a wonderful youngster, son of Sir Peter Hall. So it, and it's mother and his sister are brilliant actresses. So, I mean, these people, like, you know, it's dripping out of their fingers. So when he says some reference, and, you know, that uh, Tennessee Williams said in a later interview that Van Gogh's um, card players, he wants one of the card games to, to, to look like that. Well, of course, you have to be able to find it. You have to run upstairs and find it. So luckily, I was able to send Donnie up, and uh, he found it in two seconds, and brought it down, and there we had it, and we moved on. You know, oh yes, we want those colors, that energy, that light right down on the table. So uh, I think it's really important to, to have those books and to use them. And of course, then you use a different medium than books. You paint with color, and you paint with fabric, and you paint I with... I do. Uh, 
feathers and F all sequins. Sorts of, Come on, and say it, glitter. And the, the whole uh, <laughs> box of tools there, and and that that and stuff's around too. I'm, I keep just, all my pots of paint and glitter and and jewels and uh, pencils. I don't. I use the computer. I'm just going to say we use the computer in my studio for arcing the the organization of the play and planning how many costumes people have and doing the breakdown and everything. But I draw everything with a pencil and paper. The uh, old-fashioned way. Okay, a, a few quick facts. Give us, uh, given a show such as La Caja Faux, how many costumes are required for that I think they're on just under 400. Okay, just under 400, 400 costumes used yes. every night. Every night, eight shows a week for a year, and they have to last. So I have to know how to manufacture, first of all, I have to think of what's going to be exciting, and that, gosh, you have to... <laughs> Sometimes it comes easily, sometimes it doesn't. And uh, so you work on that. You want to, well, you want to tell the story. Who are they? When are they? What are they playing? And then you want something exciting. And then you have to know how to draw a picture of it and to communicate to the director what it will be. And then you have to take it to the shop with a, with a sketch and figure out how to make it. Mm -hmm. So you also have to know how to drape. It's called draping when you work with fabric on a form. And so you make it up like that. And then the person comes in and you put this little this little uh, muslin, we call them, on the body, and you fit it to them, and then you make it in the real fabric, and then you put it on stage, and you hope they can do it without falling down. No, Christina Applegate did not break her leg from the hem of the dress. Thank good. Of course, it was in one of my shoes, so <laughs> guilty, guilty. Well, take a show, uh, another show that you've done, like Chicago. How many oh, yes. pairs of shoes? Oh, my goodness. Well, in South the... Africa last week, it was the 18th production. Uh -huh. It's almost as many as cats around yeah. the world. 18 productions of Chicago. Mm -hmm. They're not all running, but we do have about 10 running yeah. around the world as we speak. That's a lot. You also did The Boy From Oz with Hugh Jackman. Yes. How many wigs might be used in that oh show? Oh my goodness, that's a very large. Well, you, had a, you have an ensemble of 20, six, and half are ladies. So you multiply, you take half of that, and you multiply it by about eight, eight different changes. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot. That's you did the revival recently of Annie Get Your Gun yes. with Bernadette Peters. Um, and then Reba McIntyre. And then Reba McIntyre, came in. exactly. When we thought um, it was on its last leg after Bernadette left and two other people came in, Reba said, oh, well, I'll do it. And it sort of uh, gave it a, life new, a total new life. Everyone yeah. came back to see it. It was just great. Is your work done when the show opens? Oh, no, my goodness. In fact, uh, recently, uh, I think I was referring to Christina Applegate breaking her leg. Then Charlotte D'Amboise went on, a great artist. And, of course, I had to redo all the clothes for her uh, because she's totally different from Christina. But more, specific, more recently, I mean, well, no, actually, at the same time, uh, Robert Goulet stepped into the role of Georges, uh, the great Robert Goulet, the legendary American treasure. And, of course, he is his own shape and his own size and his, so I redesigned the clothes for Lacage for him and I'm doing movies I'm filming next week is the last week the final week of filming the producers which is the movie based on the musical based on the movie Mel Brooks and uh, Susan Stroman's directing it and it's starring Nathan Lane Matthew Broderick Uma Thurman and uh, Will Ferrell so having and Uma the Thurman's, Tony Award. well, let me tell you the North Carolina collection. Uma Thurman's grandfather taught at Chapel Hill, and her father was raised there on campus. Mm-hmm. Thurman, and Will Ferrell's parents were both born and raised in Roanoke Rapids. Now there are North Carolina connection, both of them. I try to find it. I can dig it out of most people. Well, goodness, my latest show to open in a foreign land is in South Africa this week. We had a production of Chicago open, and then of course I had a. Show open on Broadway last week and one four weeks ago on Broadway also, so it's been a very busy spring. But I get in my car and I, my truck, and I drive down 95 and land in Seaboard eight hours later. And uh, it's very important to go home. Thomas Wolfe, I, I'm, re, I'm, I'm studying that comment, that title of his. What does that mean? You can go home again. Of course, you're going to a different home. I appreciate it much more now that I, than, I, that, than I did when I was a child. Couldn't wait to get away and go join the circus. Uh, of course, I'm in the circus <laughs> right now. And one of the ways that I keep saying is I'm able to go home and uh, see familiar places, see uh, where I'm from, to see how simple my background is, to see what farming means, to see my cousins, to see uh, all the things that, um, I don't know, sort of help define who you were 
and now they remain, of course, who I am. I can't imagine being a human being without being able to uh, understand references in the newspaper. Starters, waking up in the morning and reading the newspapers and know where Afghanistan is and know about uh, losing all our manufacturing jobs to China and how this, uh, this relates to us. And I, I think the liberal arts uh, education starts you out as being a human being, an educated, an educated human being, whatever that means. But I think specifically in my, uh, the field I've landed in, I didn't start out thinking I was going to be a costume designer. Uh, but I think the field that I'm working in right now, every day, something, some urgency, some need to research something, some need to find, to find uh, background information on a character, historical character. Because what I basically do is tell stories, and many of the stories are historical. Many of them are in in a specific specific time and place. And knowing how to research and how to uh, look things up, God knows you can't keep it all in your brain, but if at least you know where to look it up and uh, what area it's in and where to find it, uh, it's invaluable. I think just uh, study and read as much as you can and be interested in everything, especially things you don't know about. Uh, throw yourself in paths of moving trains, uh, travel, go see places, meet interesting people. I learned early on, look around the room and find out who seems to be the smartest person in the room and go sidle up to them because there's always someone, there are always many people smarter than you are and uh, get to know them and pick their brains and sort of really put yourself in as many places and have as many uh, experiences as possible and travel and, and stop being so insular as we Americans tend to be and uh, find out what the world is like. And when I was a, a kid and would have a birthday, I would crawl under the table when Happy Birthday was sung. I have the same feeling right now. Well, those are probably the best words sayable about someone. And uh, the only, I'm sitting there shaking in my, in my seat, and the only consolation is that uh, in the theater, it's very important that you, uh, who you, where you are on the platform, and uh, you don't want to be following two great stars. And luckily, the two great stars are following me. So I'm going to get off quite easily tonight because uh, I certainly don't want to follow them. Um, I don't know whether you know this, but, uh, well, you don't because you didn't mention it in this thing, but I used to spend every weekend, well, one weekend a month driving up to Waynesville from age zero to age 16 when my great-grandmother died in Waynesville because that's where my, half my mother's family were from. So they're still there on a mountainside. So uh, I love this area and I know it pretty well, but I don't know these new highways. I know uh, the ones that go like this when you take Dramamine. I know those highways really well. And all the uh, filling stations along the way where they had to stop and let Billy stop, if you know what I mean. <laughs> So you've really summed up everything that, that I care about in the, in the world right here. And, uh, but I did, I did want to say, oh, I also work with your neighbors over there. I just joined the, uh, the, the family of NCAT over there in Cullowee. And I'm really excited about Mar working with Mary McDuffie. And, uh, and in fact, we're, we're doing a seminar, a Broadway seminar. I'm sure that's why they asked me to join them, so I could do a, do a little, little circus turn, you know. And... Uh, so in August, we're hosting a week for the NCAT uh, students and teachers. In, uh, it's called a Broadway, Broadway Adventure or something like that. I don't know, something hokey. It's going to be very, very nice and sophisticated and hokey. But uh, all my friends are very excited. All the fancy, you know, sullied New Yorkers are all agreeing to participate. They can't wait for all these teachers. And they love the idea of the reinvigoration of uh, teachers of secondary schools. Uh, coming from different, I mean, like the math teacher is coming and the PE teacher is coming. It's not just uh, theater teachers who are coming to this NCAT thing. And so I've gotten everyone. Mel Brooks is going to talk to them. I mean, I'm telling you, sorry, they're, they're signed up already. So, uh, but it's really, really exciting uh, when you mention a great idea to all my crazy, uh, tired, decadent friends who have seen it all. They're so excited to help the NCAT people. And that is a little tying in, I'm just gonna say a little, little thing more because I really think I'm most proud of being here because here you are, the star of the liberal arts education of the whole system of the University of North Carolina. 
and to be honored by you because you feature something that I care about so deeply, I consider myself a product of the liberal arts education, both at home at the kitchen table because my parents are both teachers in the liberal arts uh, and the fact that I'm the umpteenth generation of, of kids going to Chapel Hill. I think we had two long brothers in the first graduating class and my brother and I also went there. And I don't think I would, uh, well, let me tell you this little story. My father was a little, little farm boy during the Depression in Seaboard, North Carolina, named after the railroad. How prosaic can that be? And he had this great teacher. Her name was Bernice Kelly Harris. Now, those of you who, who uh, have collections of, of out-of-print books, you, you probably have her series of books, great novelists. Well, she, her first job right out of college was teaching at this little place in the middle of nowhere, to the left of nowhere, as we describe ourselves fondly now. You can imagine where it was then, 1932. And she got convinced the school board, and she taught playwriting to high school students. And my father was her very first student. And, she, and here he was, the 11th child of a farm family, poor as dirt, or poorer, because the dirt was still there. And she helped him tell stories, family stories. You know how all of us scratch us, and you got a story, right? Got 15 stories. And so scratching this little farm boy's uh, excitement about telling the story in a playwriting form, in a, the form of playwriting. And my father, through Bernice Kelly Harris's help, won the very first scholarship in playwriting to the Playmakers, University of North Carolina Playmakers in 1932. And that totally changed the shape of our particular family's uh, life because otherwise, I, well, I wouldn't be here because he wouldn't have met my mother. Uh, who was also in the Playmakers, but I would be a farmer to this day, which actually I am. I grow cotton and peanuts, happy to say. So the inspiring of students and the, the uh, letting a little farm boy, I'm telling you, maybe, I mean, this is a long time ago, no one went to school barefoot in this room, and that he could imagine doing something other than farming or other than becoming, uh, working at the store, the local little store was pretty extraordinary. And I have gone on and received the best educations all over. I was in Chapel Hill Public Schools, happy to say, and through my various colleges, which you've enumerated here. And I think that my edge, my competitive killer edge in New York City, in the world of costuming, is because I have such a grounded liberal arts education. What do I mean by that? This summer, I did a world premiere of Stephen Sondheim's The Frogs, based on Aristophanes, The Frogs. Well, I had to make frog costumes, so biology, let's see. And I started manufacturing these shapes on people and things, and there came the frogs. Whenever I have a, a, a reference in a play, like Tennessee, what you just said, uh, Streaker Named Desire, Tennessee Williams mentions that the card scene with Stanley Kowalski, he says, in his mind, it's referred to the Van Gogh's card players. Well, I go right to my book, you know, 12 feet away, and there's the Van Gogh book, and we're able to bring that card scene alive. All that stuff that goes just like that, as I said, com killer competition. Uh, well, it's all because it's just all in there. It's all in the big mix that uh, serves me every day. And let me not forget arithmetic. Read and write and arithmetic. I mentioned the first two, but arithmetic... I also run two companies in New York, show business. Guess what? You can actually have a degree in the fine arts and actually make a living. It's true. And in fact, I go around some places and I talk to parents when they, uh, a lot of time kids who, who uh, know that I'm just going to talk to their parents and they say, well, my, they don't want me to go into the, I said, listen, I'll talk to the parents. And I explain, no, if you do the best work possible, if you have these fabulous dreams and you really get up early, in the morning and work really hard, there's a really good chance that you're going to do it. You're going to make it. And they love it when I tell their parents that. So I will say that at the drop of a hat because we need all the, all the kids with dreams need to be able to be encouraged. And uh, in this world of competition and of work going to China and of you know, people being understandably concerned, can you make it financially? Yes, of course you can. And so reading, writing, and arithmetic, I'm proud that I'm a student of those three. And I'm really proud that here we are, the star of liberal education in the whole firmament of the University of North Carolina, which is my alma mater. Uh, and going back and going forward, well, not me, my brother with his seven kids. I'm so proud that this is, 
this is what you're doing for me tomorrow, and I, I hope I continue to live up to it for the rest of my career and life. Thank you. Thank you, William. Amanda Sequoia Swimmer, a distinguished artisan and one of Cherokee's best-known potters and teachers, Amanda Sequoia Swimmer has dedicated her life to carrying on the traditions of her ancestors, immensely skilled and supremely dedicated to this noble purpose. She is today one of the great artists and icons of the Eastern Band of Cherokee. A native and lifelong resident of Big Cove on the Kuala boundary of the Eastern Band of Cherokee. Mrs. Swimmer works in the time-honored tradition that was almost lost during the 19th century removal to Oklahoma. As a young newlywed in the mid-1930s, she discovered and gathered clay with her husband, Luke Swimmer, near their home. She taught herself to form pots and experimented with firing them in an open pit, which they built in their yard. Committed, persistent, and above all talented, Mrs. Swimmer refined her techniques and sold her first pots to tourists who were brought to their home by a ranger in the Great, Mountains, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Mrs. Swimmer honed her skills while demonstrating pottery making at the Okanalufti Indian Village, where for more than 35 years, she patiently and creatively shared her love for her land, her people, her culture, and her craft with the many visitors to this unique replica of an early 18th century Cherokee community. Mrs. Swimmer's techniques are ancient. She has never used a potter's wheel. Rather, she builds her distinctive wedding vases, animal bowls, and other beautiful pieces with her hands washes these creations with water, smooths them with a paddle, and decorates them with carved paddles and sharpened sticks. After drying them in the sun, she burns them in an open fire, producing hues of brown, orange, gray, and black, depending on the type of wood being burned. The enjoyment and effort she pours into her work is evident and has brought her many awards from first place prizes at the annual Cherokee Fall Festival to North Carolina's Folk Heritage Award in 1994. Beautiful pieces of her pottery are on display across the United States, in Washington, New Mexico, and Raleigh, as well as Kuala Arts and Crafts in Cherokee. Mrs. Swimmer's grounding in her heritage and dedication to traditional values melded with her singular flair for creative beauty, are a gift to each one of us. A founding member of the Cherokee Potters Guild, she has responded to a personal imperative to hand down her considerable talents in this age-old Cherokee custom, a 2,000-year legacy that represents the longest continuous pottery tradition of any American tribe still living on its original land. Mrs. Swimmer continues to teach at Cherokee Elementary School, where she is passing the gifts of knowledge and creativity to the younger generation, and throughout Western North Carolina, including the renowned John C. Campbell Folk School and at a number of colleges. Her motivation, she says, is simply this. I always think about my old ancestors and that I ought to just keep going and keep making pottery and teaching others to make pottery. What Amanda Swimmer also has given us is a living example of humility meeting great ability, wisdom meeting acquired skills, perseverance meeting opportunity. She is a true example for each one of us of how to conduct our daily lives. 
when she says unequivocally, I just want to do my best. So to Amanda Swimmer, legendary Cherokee craftswoman, the granny of one of our people as she is known on the Kuala boundary, the University of North Carolina at Asheville cons confers the degree Doctor of Humane Letters. And as we do, we share with you the motto of our university. Gadushi, we de nega niha. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Amanda. You were a very vital part of the O'Connell Lefty Living Indian Village in Cherokee. Um, and I wonder, uh, today, uh, a number of the young people, in, younger people in Cherokee, uh, members of the Eastern Band, are seriously reacquainting themselves with the language and the culture uh, of the Eastern Band. This must make you proud that you were part of preserving that so that it's here today for this generation to embrace and to uh, celebrate. Well, um, I think it's where the kids learn when they live. And I always uh, think about that they, they should carry on and not lose their pottery and basketry like that. And we just, we try to keep them going. And I told my family, I, they can just keep on going. If I'm gone, they can go ahead and still teach the others that's coming behind and to make pottery and make basket. Well, uh, whenever I was growing up, uh, I didn't know how to talk English until I got 10 years old. We had some friends live above me and the children come around and I picked up how to speak English. So I never did speak English when I was about that old and until I picked up the language to talk English. And But I didn't even go to high school either. I just went to fourth grade. And um, after I, I told them, I said, I ain't been in the high school and learned a lot of things, but the only thing I learned is to write my name and learned a little bit how to write arithmetic in English <laughs> and spelling. And that's all they teach us when I was going to school. And so I said, you ain't going way up, but I'm not got that far, but still, I can teach you some more, a better way to live and how to learn something. That's the way I always tell my kids. And um, when I went to work at the village, I learned everything. I went started on the finger weaving, then I went on up to the top, went to the beadwork, and I'm doing some beadwork up there and then uh, went to the pottery. I'd relieve them for lunch, and I'd just go ahead and make some. And then I'd go down to the basket and relieve them, and then come back to pound corn and cook on the fireplace. I went all over the village doing all that work, so i pick up everything I could pick up to learn. When I fix my pottery, I don't never use no potter's wheel or anything that made by machine. And especially, I see so many things that's been made in a bowl. If you make a coal pot, you don't put it in a bowl. You make the coal and build it up with your big coal pot. That's the way I make mine. So a lot of things have to be done with your hand. And I appreciate that I can use my hand to make the pottery. What I learn is just from my hands. I don't have nothing but my board on my lap when I make my pottery. And I just build it up with that, with my fingers. And uh, then after I get it through, then I shine it up and put my designs on and then shine it again. Then it's ready to burn when it gets dry. It has to be dry, maybe two weeks before you can burn. Well, Amanda Swimmer, we are very grateful to you for allowing us to honor you with an honorary doctorate degree this weekend and to make you a part of the UNC Asheville family. We are very, very grateful to you. 
Well, I, I enjoy this to represent the, these students that's going to graduate, and I hope they go on and learn better life and live life <laughs> the right way on and on. It's a pleasure to meet all of you, and it's a pleasure to come here to honor the students of Western Carolina. And I'm so proud and glad to see, to meet some of the, all your friends and friendly people, and that makes me feel good. So I just thank you all for how good you've been good to us. Thank you. Mrs. Swimmer, if I said anything besides I lift up my eyes to the hills, I hope you will correct me so we can get it right tomorrow. Um, Martha Craven Nussbaum, philosopher, classicist, and public intellectual. Martha Nussbaum is one of this country's foremost thinkers, authors, and teachers on subjects of central human importance. As the Ernst Freund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics at the University of Chicago Law School, she holds appointments in the university's philosophy department, divinity school, and law school. The recipient of many academic awards and honors, notably her university's faculty award for excellence in graduate teaching, Professor Nussbaum is a prolific author and editor whose books have brought her worldwide acclaim as a legal theorist, a philosopher, and a classical scholar. Her landmark book, Cultivating Humanity, a classical defense of reform in liberal education, one of 10 she has written and an equal number she has edited, argues persuasively for the importance of connecting education with citizenship, urging us all to acknowledge the essential role of liberal arts curriculum in developing citizens of the world. All citizens of the world, she states, need three things that the liberal arts education provides. The Socratic ability to examine oneself and to think critically about ideas that are put forward in public debate. The ability to think of oneself as a citizen of the world, that is one who is related to people all over the globe by complex ties of knowledge and mutual responsibility, and the ability to use imagination, literature, and the arts to think what it might be like to be in the situation of a person very different from oneself, whether in race, in gender, national origin, or sexual identity. The values reflected in Professor Nussbaum's book are those which we at the University of North Carolina Asheville strive to instill in our students as we prepare them to be informed and thoughtful citizens in an increasingly interdependent world. The most prominent female philosopher in America, according to the New York Times, Dr. Nussbaum is perhaps the most widely read and influential classicist writing today. Professor Nussbaum has brought the great authors of Greek and Roman philosophy alive for many contemporary readers, and her contributions to reinterpreting these sources, especially those dealing with moral philosophy, have engendered a widespread reassessment of the relevance of these authors to current issues. She has taught at Harvard, at Brown and Oxford universities, and has been honored by her colleagues as a national president of the American Philosophical Association and election as a fellow in the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is also an academician in the Academy of Finland. 
the intellectual vigor and intensity that characterize her life's work as public intellectual also distinguish her classroom teaching. As a professor of philosophy and the classics at Harvard, where she earned both master's and doctoral degrees, Professor Nussbaum was an early practitioner of teaching across the disciplines, now widely practiced among liberal arts institutions, and I would argue UNC Asheville leads in this regard. Her discussions of multicultural reforms in education and her interest in non-Western traditions have made her accessible to audiences within and outside the traditional academy. A powerful and engaging speaker, which we will discover during our commencement ceremonies, Professor Nussbaum is swift and convincing whether she is discussing moral philosophy, international economics, literature and the arts, or human emotions and law, the topic of her latest book, Hiding from Humanity, Shame, Disgust, and the Law. We at the University of North Carolina at Asheville are privileged to experience her vitality and her broad-based knowledge as one of this country's acclaimed scholars. We are also privileged to experience her compassion, her reason conviction, and her insight toward the shared goals of becoming, goal of becoming citizens of the world, people who are inextricably connected to others around the globe by mutual responsibilities, shared knowledge, and similar aspirations to make a difference and to work towards solving some of the complex problems of the day. And so tomorrow, tomorrow we will award to our commencement speaker, Martha Nussbaum, a professor whom every humanities student at the University of North Carolina, every graduate, has read. And we will be honored to hear her deliver our commencement speech. Ladies and gentlemen, Martha Craven Nussbaum. I think of myself as a philosopher, uh, you know, and that's a specific kind of public intellectual. I think there are fine public intellectuals who are physicists, who are biologists, you know, and there should be in each field, I think, public intellectuals, literary people. But I think a public intellectual in philosophy is one who tries to theorize in a way that gives useful guidance for how things should go and who at the same time is able to go out into the public and speak and write in a way that relates to people and what they can understand. Um, one of my teachers was the great John Rawls and he I think is one of the greatest philosophers of the last 150 years. He happened to I think he wrote in ways that do give wonderful direction for what we should do. But as a person, because he had a very serious speech impediment, he couldn't go out in the public. He just couldn't do that kind of talking. But he always said to me, if you can do it, you have a duty to do it. And I, I took that to heart. I remember sitting with Jack in the Barclays Burger Cottage in Harvard Square, and I remember the moment when he said that to me, and I've always taken that to heart. And I think that means learning a style of writing that relates to people, and learning how to use your ability as a speaker. Now, it happened that I had a past career as an actress, and so I, you know, I had some training in acting and singing, and you know, I've, I've used that now in my public uh, speaking, and I, I just think whatever tools you have, you should use them. We academics are lucky because we have tenure, we have good salaries, and we have academic freedom. Some of the great public philosophers of the past did not have that. Rousseau's books were banned, Kant's books were banned, John Stuart Mill couldn't hold an academic appointment because he was an atheist. So, you know, we're lucky that we have all these protections, but then we have a, a tendency to get lazy and to think only of the inside of the academy. Uh, and I think, you know, because we have these protections, we have all the more of a duty to reach out and talk to people on whatever level and whatever way we can reach them. I think almost all my work begins as teaching. And, you know, one of my very first books, The Fragility of Goodness, um, came about because all of a sudden I found I had to teach a large course to about 500 freshmen at Harvard on the great ideas of ancient Greece and Rome. And so when you do that, you have to think, what do I really care about? And you have to just leave aside 
uh, you know, preferably you know it, but you kind of leave to one side the trappings of scholarship. And you have to get to the root of what really engages you. What is your real reason for being there in the first place? You're very exposed as a teacher because, you know, if you don't care about anything, students see that right away. So you have to put your passion on the line. And I do remember just coming in there and thinking, well, what about Plato's Symposium is really important to me. And then I came up with some things that later became chapters in my work. So that always happens to me, sometimes in graduate courses, sometimes in undergraduate courses. But it's the challenge of the student. They're not there to learn some scholarly footnotes. They're there to to live, you know, and, and, and they won't, they'll be bored by you if you don't, if you're not alive, if you're not really saying something that comes from your gut and, and from what really led you to that profession in the first place. So I feel that that's, um, that's wonderful. It's a great stimulus. And then to me, my challenge is then to give something back to them that would take them that next step further so that when they go out and they're going to be journalists or they're going to be in business or whatever, still those philosophical ideas won't get lost. They'll still be there in some form. And you know, I think it's a tremendous opportunity we have in America because in so much of the world, undergraduates come in to read only one subject. And so, you know, they'll never see a philosopher if they're doing physics or engineering or even law because they do law as a, an undergraduate subject. But we're, we're really so lucky that we have this liberal education concept. And so that means that we have a chance to reach out to all students who are going to be doctors and going to be lawyers and engineers. And we can give them something of what we think about citizenship and about the life of the imagination. And you know, hopefully it stays with them. I think our culture discourages the examined life. It's so fast paced, it's so busy, and it's so driven by commercialism. Uh, so we have this window in people's lives that's four years long. And if they're working a lot, they may not even have that much of a window then. So we, it, it's our challenge to use that window in such a way that there's something that's so strong that it will come out even in the much less propitious circumstances that people are in later in life. And so nothing makes me happier than to have a student that I knew 20 years ago come back and say, well, you know, I'm now writing for blah, blah, newspaper, but I was really thinking about Plato the other day. Because I think that, that then you can go back to something, even when you don't have time to discover something totally new. And that, so that, that's what I hope. Now, I, I also worry that liberal arts education is under attack from cost-cutting, from pre-professionalism. And I think it would be the worst thing that we could do for American democracy to cut back on liberal education. It's the thing that keeps us alive as a nation where people can talk together instead of just fighting. You know, Socrates said that he was like a gadfly on the back of the noble but sluggish horse, and that was the Athenian democracy. And he was waking it up so it could conduct its business more reasonably. Well, we need that. You know, we have talk radio, we have TV media, where you don't get a serious debate, where you just get sound bites and people attitudinizing. And so we have a chance to get people to really listen to each other and listen across differences and talk to each other. And then maybe they'll go out into the world and, and they'll be able to do that. So I feel like it's so crucial for the health of the democracy that this liberal arts tradition should continue. Martha Nussbaum, we are so grateful to you for allowing us to award an honorary degree to you. You honor us by being here, by presenting the commencement address, and by spending time on our campus with the UNC Asheville family. We look forward to seeing you, you here again. Me, and I'm very, really honored to be here. I love what you stand for here at UNC Asheville. I've just had a wonderful afternoon with the philosophy students and faculty from lots of different departments. So believe me, I admire what you're doing. So keep at it. Well, thank you very much. As, as you've heard, you're going to have to listen to me tomorrow, so I'm going to be very brief tonight. Uh, but I just want to talk about you and what's happening here. I, I just spent a really great afternoon with a group of faculty and students here who were so alive and so full of terrific questions, questions that weren't just prompted by some narrow sense of professionalism, but that really were questions about their lives and their roles as citizens in the world. 
And they ranged across the disciplines without any kind of self-defensiveness about whether they were getting the professional jargon right. So, you know, I felt here we see what a liberal arts education really does contribute to citizenship, getting people to come alive, think thoughtfully, talk with one another respectfully, listening on topics of great public importance, and, and then to take that out into this society, which is so fast moving and so given to sound bites and to the substitution of invective for real argument. And let's hope to um, make that culture a little bit more like a genuine, deliberative democracy. Uh, I wrote Cultivating Humanity after a period when I had come to an international institute where we were working out discussions of quality of life in developing countries. And I was working with an international team of economists and, and other people. And um, I started to reflect on my own education and what had been good in it, what had been bad in it. And I thought clearly what had been bad was that I just wasn't prepared to meet people from the rest of the world. I knew nothing about the non-Judeo-Christian religious traditions. I knew nothing about the history of India or China or other, or Africa. So I was pretty ill-equipped from those points of view. I was a little bit better equipped because I had learned philosophy and, and I had learned to think critically and to listen to people and to try to engage in argument with them. And then I think there was another part of my education that didn't come from the classroom at all, but from the fact that I'm kind of a, a failed actress and I did do some professional acting briefly in my life. But, but in the theater, I discovered the power of the arts to communicate to people across all kinds of barriers of suspicion, of mistrust, of stigma. Uh, and, and in the theater itself, I, I discovered a, a world that was, um, I always think of Ingmar Bergman's wonderful phrase in Fanny and Alexander, the little world. I mean, that there's a kind of counterculture that's so uh, accepting and, and, and diverse. And, and I met there, you know, having grown up in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, and met only Protestants and, and white people and people who at least pretended that they were heterosexual. I met in the theater, I met people who were openly many different things, and this was so fantastic. So I think that actually that was uh, one of the best parts of the preparation that I had for engaging in international debate, and that's one reason that I've so much stressed the role of the arts. So I think what you're doing here, especially in a state university system where often students don't even have the opportunity to engage in this kind of interdisciplinary, integrative, arts-infused education, but they just have huge lecture classes and so on. It's, it's really moving to me, and it's very, very important. So I just want to say bravo, and I'm really, really honored and pleased to be with you here. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's fitting that we stand once more and applaud our honorands one last time. Thank you. Thank you, each of you, for your powerful examples. Now, if I could directly to uh, our students, as you prepare for a very important day in your lives tomorrow. Tonight, you've seen individuals whose example inspires us all. I look in a special way to you who join us this evening, our graduates. For in the extraordinary lives of our honorands, you can see a powerful testimony to the lessons of liberal education in their intellectual curiosity, in their refusal to accept the easy or the expedient in place of what is right, in their fundamental commitment to human dignity and accomplishment, they call you as they call all of us to the full achievement of our promise. And in a special way, their example calls you to redefine the possible in your lives and in the world you will inherit. Each of our honorants has through their lives given new definition to that which is possible. That's the magic of this evening, and that's what your commencement is really about. That like our distinguished guests, you can define 
the possible. And the magic of this evening and the events of tomorrow morning resonate in a most special way for Mary and for me, in that this is the last honorans dinner and our last commencement that we weekend that we will have the honor of sharing with you. In Ann Ponder, you welcome a magnificent new chancellor who will find in your support and friendship the same inspiration that has lifted the Mullen family for the past six years. So at a point of personal privilege to each of you, each of you a colleague, each of you a friend on the wonderful journey that is set to culminate, we thank you. And while this journey now ends, a new one begins. And the friendships that have marked this passage will continue in all the journeys and adventures to come. So from Frankie and James, who's somewhere, right there. Uh, this is what happens when the sitter doesn't make it. Um, so from all of us, God bless each of you, and uh, God bless the University of North Carolina at Asheville until we meet again. Thank you.